Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for coming along for this uh, session today. My name is Chris Humphrey. I'm from the Accounting and Finance uh, Division within the uh, Alliance Manchester Business School, and I'm going to be here basically as the coordinator of today's session um, being presented by Paolo Quattroni on the value of nothing accounting in the post-truth era. Uh, just to give you a few um, instructions in terms of um, uh, the procedures that we'll be adopting. People will be muted on arrival. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and also streamed live to Facebook. Uh, if you are, as, a, as the session develops, if any questions appear, um, you've got the option to, um, uh, to, to write your questions into the chat facility at the bottom of the screen. If you just scroll down to the bottom, it, it will come up in the middle of your screen. And uh, if you type that in, we'll get those questions raised at the end of the session. If there's loads of questions, we may well uh, organize a separate uh, uh, video event where Paolo will address those questions specifically in an offline sort of scenario. And um, uh, if you want to view the session, you can view it either in, uh, in, a, in the speak of that mode or uh, in the uh, gallery view, which uh, is in the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, so I won't. Uh, delay anymore. I'll just say probably that uh, with the title of uh, Value of Nothing Accounting in the Post-Truth Era, I would just like to say very truthfully that I'm really looking forward to Paolo's session and I think you will enjoy it a lot. And so over to Fiona, who is going to, as head of the Alliance Manchester Business School, to give you a brief overview of uh, Paolo's uh, career and uh, interests, etc, etc. So Fiona, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. So delighted to welcome so many of you here this afternoon to hear from our colleague, Professor of Accounting, Government and Society, Paolo Quadroni. So in this series of original thinking webinars, we hear from newly recruited and newly promoted professors in Alliance Manchester Business School who are delivering their inaugural lectures. They offer an opportunity for us in the business school to welcome new colleagues and also to celebrate the success of newly promoted professors. So we didn't really want to miss this opportunity during the current pandemic, when it's more important than ever to connect and support each other, that we continue to do this activity. So we move these events online and open them up so once upon a time, they were an internal event within the school, very much for just academic colleagues, but we have made them now open to a wider audience. And we're really thrilled that we did do that. Uh, and this year, it has been a, a really great success in terms of uh, attracting a wide and diverse audience to hear from our colleagues. Thanks, Fiona, for, uh, for your introduction. Thank you all for being uh, here with us tonight. Uh, I saw many familiar faces and that is very, very, very nice and rewarding. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues uh, at AMBS, uh, because as Phil said, I, I joined a year ago. I joined on the 1st of April, it sounds like April Fool's, because I've never been to Manchester since I joined. Uh, despite that, uh, I do feel uh, Tom and colleagues have been very, very helpful, and uh, uh, especially with the with the teaching, with the new procedures and everything. And so I'm very, very gra grateful. I want to uh, thank all, also Chris for uh, uh, chairing this uh, session today, given that uh, uh, this is a, a very busy period for him for all sorts of reasons. Um, and last but not least, uh, Abby and Sarah who have helped me with, uh, you know, from the event uh, and IT and audio department. So normally, when I when I start my lectures, I, I try to start with a with a nice quote from a sociologist. One of my preferite is uh, Jim March, uh, but another preferite, uh, honorary sociologist, I would say, uh, is uh, Dilbert, um, and I I want to start with him. Uh, and this is one of his uh, vignettes uh, where, he say, you know, where he says, uh, stockholders are worried that our profits are nothing but accounting gimmicks, they are tricks. Uh, uh, I'm putting you in charge of destroying all of our accounting records. And, uh, and then Dilbert responds, that's illegal. Oh, then just make them more confusing. Um, and uh, I think that this is uh, 
an interesting an interesting vignette because it reminds me of uh, of Bruno Latour when he said that we have never been more than and so this this uh, you know idea of uh, sign finally delivering truth uh, has never been is a dream that has never been accomplished and the same applies I would say for uh, accounting and so I want to paraphrase. Uh, what Bruno Latour said, and uh, accounting has never been clear. Um, in a sense, it has not been uh, invented for uh, uh, the purpose of giving transparency. It has been invented for uh, uh, all sorts of other uh, other reasons. But I want you to face one uh, one paradox, uh, which is this one uh, during during this lecture today. So the moment in which we uh, reject the idea of transparency, possibly we lay the conditions for uh, achieving it. Um, and uh, uh, this is what I would like to discuss with you uh, today. And I want to do that, uh, as Fiona mentioned uh, before, uh, by going back uh, into the history of accounting for a while, uh, not the history of the of the Jesuits, which is my forte, but the a more recent history uh, of, uh, of accounting. And I want to bring some Italian wisdom uh, into this uh, virtual room. And I want to discuss um, uh, I want to discuss the story of the Istituto per la Ricostruzione Industriale, which was um, uh, a quite uh, important uh, uh, holding owned entirely by the state, founded by uh, Mussolini in 1933, but more importantly, uh, that was the, uh, the organization that uh, administered the funds of the Marshall Plan uh, after the end of the Second World War. And that is uh, the story I want to uh, share with you partially. Um, just to give you an idea of how big uh, ERI was, um, uh, with Patrizio Monfardini and Pascal Ruggero, we have contributed to the history of uh, this organization. And there is a sixth volume history, which is now on, uh, actually, <laughs> it's, it's below my computer to raise the laptop at the moment. Uh, uh, so six volume of uh, of text to reconstruct that uh, that story, and one of the chapters uh, begins in this way, and it gives you the the idea of how important for uh, Italy and for the post-war uh, period in Italy Erie it was. So imagine you were a tourist um, in the fifties or sixties in, uh, and you wanted to travel to Italy. Uh, very likely, if you came from the United States, you, you would have taken a, a transatlantic, uh, uh, the Michelangelo. Michelangelo was uh, built by Fincantieri that was owned by Erie. Uh, or uh, you would have traveled with Alitalia, which, by the way, stands for always late in taking off, always late in approaching. Uh, uh, and uh, Alitalia was owned by uh, Erie. Then you would have landed in uh, Fiumicino Airport. You would have hired a beautiful Alfa Romeo Duetto, the one that uh, characterizes the Dolce Vita. Uh, and Alfa Romeo was owned by Erie. Then you would take the first and longest motorway in uh, Europe, the, the one that goes from Naples to uh, Milan, the A1. Uh, and uh, that motorway was built by Autostrade, and Autostrade was owned by uh, Iri. Uh, then you would get into Milan, into your hotel. You would pick up the phone to call your uh, relatives and say, oh, I safely arrived to uh, Milan despite the way in which the Italians drive. And uh, uh, that phone would have been, and the line would have been owned by uh, SIP that was owned by Iri. Then, uh, you are in Milan, you, it's Christmas, you want to enjoy the typical Christmas cake, uh, uh, the typical Milanese uh, Christmas uh, cake, the panettone, and Motta was also owned by Iri. So in between Iri, ENI, and Enel in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, a quite huge proportion of the Italian GDP uh, was produced by, by these three state-owned uh, corporations. So the Italian miracle was not made by Fiat. It was not symbolized. It was symbolized by the Fiat Cinquecento, but it was not made by Fiat. By Fiat. It was made by uh, state-owned uh, corporations. In this story, there are a, a few characters uh, that are particularly important, all of them Catholic. Um, and so uh, one of, of them is a, is a pretty unknown uh, figure for, uh, for Italians as well. I discovered him very recently because a, a biography of him was written and published in 2020, I think, uh, Sergio Paronetto. 
Sergio Veronetto, a fervent Catholic, uh, uh, very close to the Vatican, uh, up to the point that some uh, people think that he was actually working close to the uh, Americans and being the trade union between the Vatican and the uh, American intelligence. Um, so close to the to the Vatican that he was uh, the advisor of Giovanni Battista Montini. That is a, not a name that doesn't tell you anything, very likely. But if I say uh, Pope Paul the Sixth, uh, possibly does. He was also the economic advisor of the first uh, president of the Italian Republic, um, Alcide de Gasperi, and uh, he organized the uh, Italian intellectual, the Italian Catholic intellectuals in between 1936 and uh, the, uh, the the time of his death. He, he unfortunately passed away pretty pretty recently, and he did that by organizing, uh, you know, by editing a journal that was called Studium. In this journal, they were asking you know, themselves, what does it mean to be a, a, a modern Catholic? What does it mean to be a professional Catholic? So if I'm a lawyer, if I'm an accountant, if I'm a manager, if I'm an engineer, what does it mean to be a Catholic accountant? What does it mean to be a Catholic engineer? Um, he organized also a series of meetings in his house in Via Reno in, uh, in, uh, in Rome, and quite a few important people who then uh, uh, contributed to the uh, Italian economic development and social development in the post-war uh, period took part to these meetings. People like Giulio Andreotti, for instance, they're the most important, very likely, uh, Italian politicians of the post-war period, uh, uh, all of them, uh, you know, Christian Democrats. Uh, Aldo Moro, uh, the, the secretary of the, of the DC that was killed by, in the 70s by the Red Brigades. Alcide de Gasper, the first president of the um, of the Italian Republic when it was established in 1948. Uh, and uh, uh, people like Pasquale Saraceno, um, Sergio Parametto became uh, Vice Director General of IRI in 1943. Saraceno worked at IRI even before the beginning of the, of the war and was the uh, architect of, of, of the IRI model. The IRI model was a kind of compromise uh, between capitalism and socialism. So the holding was owned by the state, but the subsidiaries were floated on the market. Uh, and so that was a way of uh, symbolizing, in a sense, the fact that Italy was a, a, a country in between the East and the West at that, uh, at that point in time. Um, so uh, Italy was also a very fragmented country. You have to think that it was uh, the country with the largest communist party outside uh, USSR at that time. Uh, and so they had the, uh, the role and the need to uh, devise techniques uh, that, would, um, that would have uh, taken care of this huge, uh, of this huge uh, uh, complexity, social complexity in which Italy found itself uh, in the post-war period. Um, Sergio Parato, Pasquale Saraceno, and uh, uh, Ezio Vanoni uh, led these meetings in Biarreno and then the meetings uh, in a monastery in, uh, um, in Tuscany, the uh, monastery of Camaldoli, and wrote what is known as the Camaldoli Code, where they defined the uh, Catholic social doctrine for uh, uh, the Italy that was, uh, that was uh, you know, that was to come. Already in 1930, in 1940, the Vatican was pretty aware of the fact that the regime, the fascist regime would have uh, collapsed. And from 1943 onwards, it was very clear that we would have fallen uh, under the influence of the United States. And they came out with this idea of uh, common good, uh, which I will uh, go back to uh, to in a moment. Uh, these three these three persons. So Etzevanoni then became Minister of Finance. Uh, Saraceno worked at IRI uh, in very uh, senior positions. Uh, Paronetto, uh, uh, Vice Director General of uh, of that organization. All of them from the same village in uh, the north of Italy. So, in a sense, they incarnate what Italy is, uh, is about. I remember John Paget in his work on the Renaissance, uh, a, 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 a mixture of links between family ties, social ties, and uh, economic ties. Uh, a few, what is interesting about this story is that uh, those people who took part. Uh, to the writing of this Camaldoli Code, most of them then became part of the uh, Italian Constitution Assembly. And so the Italian Constitution is intrinsically a Catholic uh, Constitution. Fourth uh, character there 
is uh, Gino Zappa, the founder of uh, modern Italian accounting. It would be the equivalent for the UK and for the uh, for the British colleagues uh, and the international colleagues in, in in this room, they would know him as well. It would be the equivalent of Anthony Opwood for uh, for Italy, uh, even more powerful, I would say, than than Anthony Opwood. And he was uh, a, a theorist who theorized accounting in a non-positivist way. Uh, if uh, um, yeah, you know, Sven Model is in uh, in this uh, this meeting. I would say that uh, possibly Zappa was a critical realist. Uh, so uh, for them, the idea of uh, pursuing uh, uh, one single objective, uh, one version of truth, was really almost blasphemy. Uh, in in some of his articles, uh, Paronetto wrote, "I want to find the grace of God in the." Uh, in the cost accounting calculations of Finster, the, the, uh, the company uh, related to steel that he owned and for which he was keeping the accounts. Or what Pasquale Saraceno, for instance, said in, uh, in one of his papers where he, he said uh, that basically he equated scientific management to fascism because he was so single-minded that he would, he would have seen uh, this as a serious threat to the social cohesion of the Italian uh, economy. To give you a sense of uh, this context, to give you a sense of what it meant to be a Catholic trying to understand um, uh, you know, the complexity, I want to do with you something that hopefully will work, which is sharing with you a, a piece of a film by uh, Paolo Sorrentino, which is called Il Divo. The Divine, which is about Giulio Andreotti, uh, so one of those politicians that took part to these uh, meetings in his house and, and to the uh, writing of the Camaldo Code, and then a, a key person in the in the history of Italy and the Christian democracy. Um, and that is, uh, you know, Andreotti here is at the end of his political career. He's already under trial uh, for being associated to mafia in uh, in uh, uh, in a trial that was uh, run in my hometown in Palermo. Um, he has been accused of instigating the assassination of many people, including people like Aldo Moro, so very close friends of him, um, and he names them, them by the first name. Uh, and I, I want to share this with you to give you a context of, of, of what it meant to be a Catholic and a Christian Democrat for these people.
So what does this mean for what these guys did at, um, at Erie? So when the Americans came with the Marshall Plan, they not only gave money to Italy, but they also wanted to give uh, accounting knowledge. And they said, okay, we, we give you money, uh, you turn around your firms and you do that through uh, the management skills that we will, uh, management techniques that we will uh, give you, and then you sell them on the markets. And the Italian that time were slightly more uh, influential, possibly and intelligent, I would say, than the Italians that uh, we have nowadays said, oh, no way. So this is how you want to organize the income statement with, you know, revenues and then going down to profit. Uh, that is not an income statement. That is a political statement. It tells us that the most important thing is uh, maximizing profit in the interest of one party only, which is the shareholder. That is not what we want to do. What we want to do is to search for the common good. The common good defined in a very ambiguous way, uh, defined as those conditions that allow uh, the, pursue, the pursuit of individual interests. And so it was an enabler of the pursuit of this individual interest, but also a constrainer of this individual interest, because in pursuing your individual interests, you have to consider what the others did. And so in reacting to this, uh, to this uh, American influence, they started to develop an alternative system of budgeting and planning from 1950s onwards. And that was based on the idea of value added. So you have got your sales there, you then uh, uh, generate some value added, and you distributed it to employees through salaries, to banks, uh, through interest, to state, uh, through income taxes, uh, to shareholders, of course, through dividends, and to the firm that became the institution that was devoted to the uh, mediation among these different, uh, dif dis dis different interests. This income statement is an indifferent uh, as an indifferent form, it does not privilege one stakeholder versus the others. It stays in between, exactly like uh, Andreotti. It, it pushes this idea of rationality, as I've uh, written here, where uh, the emphasis is on the on the ratio, on the on, on the proportions. And for those who know a bit of Latin, ratio in uh, in Latin does not mean reason; it means account. And so, an account is about establishing these proportions. And this indifference is also what allowed the mediation between the production and the distribution of value. So for instance, when the Americans came, they wanted to invest in the North because it was the most productive area of, uh, of Italy. But then the Italians said, no, but we are a, a nation, we are a community, so we also have to invest in the South, regardless of the fact that the, uh, that the productivity of that investment is not as high in the, um, in the, in, uh, in, in the North. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, distributing it uh, in a way that was proportional amongst the different kind of uh, stakeholders, managing and mediating amongst different and various con contrasting interests, and uh, balancing economic development with social development. Yes, I, 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 from an economic point of view, I would like to invest in the North. From a social point of view, I have to take care of the South as well. This. Uh, of course, was a kind of reducing the complexity of uh, of the uh, of that very fragmented society to an economic measure, but to understand and augment our uh, ability to understand that uh, complexity. And that goes back, and here is, of course, my quote of of the Jesuit order. It goes back to the Catholic root uh, of accounting. Uh, you know, they were crazy about numbers, but, but they were also very worried about uh, the reductionist power of numbers. And so their cash box had two keys and uh, what you had, you count what is visible. And so you have the, 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 the equivalent of a CFO here who owns one key. And so you, you count uh, material means value a thing. And then the rector is the spokesperson for whatever is not financial is, is the uh, spokesperson for the mission of that order, and that, that mission is always in a state of flux. And so you count what is visible to interrogate what is invisible, immaterial ends, values, not things. And this is the importance of the value of not things. This is what the, the, the title of this lecture. Unfortunately, we are now fixated with transparency. We are fixated, uh, we are moving from that wisdom of balancing, of mediating uh, interest to measurement, and that inevitably leads to uh, compliance. If I were in a class, I would ask you, what do you see here? 
and I have used this picture in some of my lectures, and the students say, oh, there is Rialto there, you know, there is a gondola and so forth and so on. They, they, they look at it better. They see that there is a guy standing in between you and that gondola. And that is Liu Bolin, uh, an artist who, from my point of view as an accountant, plays with the idea of transparency. Um, and uh, tells us a couple of things. The first thing is that when you see an objective, which is your gondola in a very busy Venice, uh, don't rush towards it because you can actually bump into what you believe that you see, but you're actually not seeing. Uh, so what he tells us is that transparency is a matter of perspective. So if you move slightly, you will realize that there is a, a man painted uh, as his uh, background there. You would realize that transparency is a matter of arrangement. So if you look at uh, the brushes, the camera, all the paraphernalia of the things that allow this picture to be taken, you would realize that uh, you have to consider that transparency depends on a series of institutional arrangements. And actually what is outside that picture is more important than what is in the picture. And the third thing is that transparency takes a lot of, uh, it's a practice that takes a lot of work. It's the least natural thing in order to uh, make you believe that you're seeing everything that takes uh, a lot of work. Uh, an income statement like the one that the Americans wanted to import to export to Italy is exactly like that. Uh, it has a very clear perspective. It looks at the world from a very clear perspective. That is the perspective of the shareholder and uh, generates a target that if you follow and pursue will make you lose sight of other important things. It will make you blind. So believing in transparency, actually, and pursuing this ideal of transparency defined in this way, with this particular focus and perspective, in fact, what it does is to generate opacity, to generate uh, blindness. Unfortunate fixation with transparency, objectivity, measurement has been expanding from financial, from the financial sphere. Hello, to... get in, you get in the front, you get in the front, Pardon? you go. Okay, so I'll keep going. Uh, unless uh, Chris tells me to uh, to stop. Yeah, so this... yeah, five minutes or so, Paolo, I think we're fine. If yeah, we... yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very close to, to, to the end. So two or three slides and we and we are done. So uh, this fixation with uh, me measurement has been expanding from the financial realm to the societal realm to the uh, environmental realm and now going back to, to the uh, IFRS, uh, which is now uh, I've just published, published a, consult, a consultation paper on sustainability reporting. And uh, I was discussing with Chris a few days ago uh, this paper and some work from some colleagues uh, in between Oxford and, and Harvard who just published a paper on, uh, on how to measure purpose. And we said rather than measuring purpose, we should discuss the purpose of measurement. Uh, and um, uh, so there is this, uh, everything is becoming a target. Now we have the SDGs. Uh, this morning, Chris shared with me uh, an article that the students uh, shared with him that I put it here. Uh, so thanks to technology, we will have a single source of truth. Imagine what Andreotti would have said uh, if he had read this, uh, this article. That made me spin my head very, uh, very, you know, very, Strange. So I fear that this emphasis and this, uh, you know, fixation with targets may actually be quite dangerous. Um, so we'll end up uh, killing nature. We will end up uh, killing the things that we actually care about. I think about uh, REF, TEF and KEF and how that is affecting universities and uh, as academics and whether that is uh, you know, a positive or, uh, or a negative uh, issue. Uh, Liu Bolin is very well aware of this expansion. And so he has been playing with the SDGs as well. Here, this is a, 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 a work commissioned by actually the United Nations. And he is standing in there holding a, a written uh, future, okay? But I think that what he does and what he warns us is that fixating on, uh, on targets may be maybe and fixating on measures may be complicated. It may also be complicated because we lose sight of the arrangements that lead us to believe that certain measures are, are right. Uh, a, a very quick example, um, a, a report of a, of a large restaurant chain uh, done according to or prepared according to the GRI um, 
uh, rules uh, and in order to define the quality of uh, food served, they, they use one of the measures uh, that was proposed that was the average quality intake of that menu. Um, the, the, uh, because of that measure, they introduced salads, so the average quality intake of that menu went down and they uh, responded to the demand of an healthier uh, of an healthier menu. But the effect of that is shift of responsibility to the customer. Now you enter into my restaurant, you have two choices. You can eat the very high cholesterol burger or the salad. What do you want? It's your choice. It's your responsibility. And so depending on how we set these measures, uh, we may actually go against the, the very purpose for which these measures uh, were created. And uh, I'm getting close to the end. So I want to uh, go back to that idea of value added that Eri uh, so successfully, because the Italian miracle was done uh, through value added, was done through Eri, ENI, and Enel, which all reported with value added. In value added, you've got the value created, uh, you've got the different stakeholders. I want to add a stakeholder here, which is nature. Um, so what we do when we produce uh, value, we take from nature here, we take raw material, we take energy, we distribute the value that we create to humans, but we don't give anything back to non-humans. We don't give anything back to nature. This simple line would symbolize the need for uh, showing how we are, uh, um, how we are uh, taking care of, uh, uh, of nature by putting our hand in our pockets. It's nice to say, I want to pursue my SDGs, but then I keep doing, I keep doing accounts in the way in which I'm doing. So it's nice to say, look at these measures, but actually all the, all the stuff is going behind my, uh, my, uh, my back. It's like a of hand. While instead, if we just uh, economic values with non-economic purposes and objectives, then we can create a space of interrogation of how pursuing these things actually affect the production and distribution of value. So we can create these uh, relationships, we can interrogate the, the links between those and so forth and so on. And this work that I'm doing with uh, Ariel Acadio on, on a recently uh, funded project. Uh, now, my plea for all of you, and I'm really close to the end, Chris, thanks for your, for your patience, is to stop this fixation with objectivity and measures and let accounting regain the power of judgment. And we have all been in lockdown for a year, so I guess that you have watched uh, you know, many series on, uh, on Netflix and very likely The Crown. And there is a wonderful scene in The Crown uh, where uh, Queen Elizabeth um, is uh, anointed. It's the first uh, coronation ceremony where, uh, uh, which has been broadcasted world worldwide. And when she's anointed, this uh, veil is put on her head and no one can see it. And uh, in Paris, in exile, there was the Duke of Windsor uh, with his friend uh, and uh, he, you know, the friends ask him, oh, why do they put this veil there? You know, we should, have now in this era of technology of big data, we should have everything transparent. And he responds, who wants transparency when you can have magic? And so we are back to those gyms uh, that we, uh, with which we started at the beginning. And I want to stay with that, and this is my last slide, Chris, uh, uh, with that magic in a sense, because accounting has always been about, about post-truth. I mean, this is, uh, you know, Luca Pacioli, the uh, Summa di Arithmetica uh, Geometria Proporzione and Proporzionalità. And not many people know that, he, that uh, or many people know that he was the, the, the author of the first conventionally recognized treatise of accounting. Not many people know, and Elena actually discovered that. He was also an author of a book on magic because numbers uh, can be tricky, and we now use, I mean, that transparency is a trick. But uh, transparency can also be enchanting. And it is enchanting the moment in which you separate means from ends. You use money to interrogate the ambiguity of, uh, of purpose, the ambiguity and the complexity of the uh, social realm. So uh, that is what uh, I would like to do in my next few years until retirement, which very likely will never, will never arrive given the situation of the US suspension fund. 
uh, in Manchester and with uh, the uh, centre for which I've been recently appointed care and with my colleagues like Chris and uh, a few others we're working on uh, on, on few things. So a, a bit, uh, two, four minutes late, apologies about that. Thank you for being uh, with me and with us uh, tonight. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paolo, very much. There's been a sort of a conversation going on while you've been talking, and I think probably uh, there are a couple of people I can pick out for questions, but just to try and capture the general theme of that discussion, it seems to almost be a sense from a variety of people commenting that, you know, we, we know that, you know, accounting requires judgment. Where, um, you know, accountants speak of a, a, a true and fair view, not the true and fair view. Um, we, we, people are relating things to, we have done value added accounting before, you know, maybe there's comparability to um, Islamic accounting and uh, different approaches there. All the other questions or comments about, um, well, you know, given the history, history of, of Italian accounting and stuff like this, are there examples in Italy where people are doing accounting? So you have this strand, which is almost saying, we know, we know these issues. So I guess the question for you maybe to respond to would be, what's driving this then? If we know this, if we know and we value or can recognize judgment, what's driving this increasing push or this desire for one notion of truth? you know, or this belief that there is some way of making things transparent in an arguable fashion. Is there, what are the undercurrents to this? Because it, shouldn't we be learning from the past? Uh, yeah, important. And you, you, you said the, the word learning, which also means that we should be teaching these things in order to create a, a new profession, which is uh, more uh, in tune with this uh, relatively recent approach to accounting. Uh, I always say that when I was an undergraduate student, if I, and my, my supervisor who is an extremist of the center, exactly like, or a center extremist, exactly like Andreo. Um, you know, if I told my supervisor accounting is about pro providing truth or even multiple versions of truth, he would have taken my ear and, uh, and throw me away from, from from the room and, and ask me to receive the exam uh, at the next uh, session. So I think there are a couple of things. One is insecurity. So we are not uh, we are not uh, able to deal with the uh, discomfort of dealing with ambiguity and uh, uncertainty. We we want to make things uh, clear. I've got the you know the book by Theodore Porter there, Trust in Numbers. We trust numbers because they bring this aura of objectivity and we believe that uh, you know they're assuring to us. And so it's a matter of insecurity. Uh, but you can uh, overcome this insecurity if you actually show that by abandoning that uh, insecurity, you will know more, you will know less. This is what uh, also Latour says, a bit of relativism brings me uh, away from reality. A lot of relativism brings me closer to reality. The moment in which I do not buy the story that the corporation is pushing to me through the corporate reports and uh, which is certified by the authors, I'll start to scratch the surface. I ask more questions. I want to know more. So the moment in which I don't believe in one single truth, actually, I don't believe in truth at all. And this is the paradox that I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to share with you today. I will know more. I will not know less. So that is what accountants should be doing. Uh, uh, I also try to give this uh, message at the uh, PD Lick lecture at the ICAW and saying, you know, the more you, uh, you, you think that we should provide truth and certainty, the more your, uh, your profession will be, will be taken by informatics, big data and analytics. And by the way, if you talk to people in informatics, big data and analytics, they will tell you exactly the same thing, that there is no one single version of the truth. It's only when you do not know things that you believe that they actually deliver what they promise. Um, and then the second reason, so one is uncertainty, and uh, so uh, let's say uh, the, the the lack of the lack of uh, you know not being uh, not being very secure of ourselves, uh, uh, that discomfort with uh, with uncertainty. The second is ideology uh, and the the idea of uh, of markets and uh, and the fact that accounting should provide 
transparency to transactions in order to improve the efficiency of markets. By now, we know the markets fail. We know that the transparency fails. Paradoxically, the response to these uh, to these failures is more markets and more transparency. We want to have something different, and we don't need to go very far back in the history of accounting to understand what to do. Value-added accounting could be one way. It's not the only way, but it could be one way. Okay. Uh, I think if we just open up to a question, on the grounds that I think David Calver has probably made more contributions in the discussion than anybody else. David, would you like to ask a specific question? Lots and lots of questions that come to my head, but probably the biggest one is whether there are some differences of perspective that can help us in some of the sustainability challenges that the world faces. So for example, look at more of a balance sheet approach than an income and expenditure approach. So looking at things like natural capital in national and then a world balance sheet, which I've actually drawn up myself, the world balance sheet. I'm not the first to do that. The first was a guy called Mulhall in the 1880s. We've come a long way from then, but he was trying to describe how looking at our stewardship of assets is possibly going to be a more productive way of going forward than our focus, our, our kind of... Uh, uh, myopia on GDP and income and uh, and so on. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. Thank you for asking it, because in, in a sense, if I go back to the Italian wisdom, we have abandoned the idea that we should uh, base our accounting on the calculation of the value of assets uh, in 1927, uh, when Gino Zappa started to uh, you know, profess his different view, which is uh, the center is actually the income statement. And why is that? Because a, a view of uh, you know, of a capital-based or a capital-focused accounting is that the, you know, it's a, it's a pre-industrial in a sense. You've got the tree, the tree produces a fruit, and that fruit uh, is, the, is, is the value or is the, is the income. We've, we've gone well beyond that when the Industrial Revolution is the, is the processes that generate value. With the, uh, you know, financialization of the work is the market that generates value. With, uh, uh, the importance of now societal and uh, uh, environmental issues is not the capital that we have to look for, but is that those relationships that I, I showed in the in the slide before. So how we manage all of these relationships. So it would be it would be uh, very naive to believe that, uh, as it is very naive to believe that we can have a solution that will save the. Uh, the, the, the environment for good and forever, we will have to be proportionate. We will have to, to do balance. We'll, you know, we will have to balance in things. One of the things that I find very upsetting is, for instance, this uh, frenzy with uh, electric cars. Every, everyone talks about the, 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 the lack of CO2 emissions, but no one talks about the damage that we do to nature for the batteries and the lithium. So, so it's a matter of balance. Maybe we can achieve a better compromise by still having some diesel cars around uh, and, uh, and, and opening a debate about what we should be doing. And so opening about a, a debate about value added statement and those uh, SDGs and that space becomes a, a democratic space for, uh, uh, for debate. Thanks, Paolo. Um, just, to, just to try and capture um, a couple of other questions. Um, I think there's, a, there's also a theme, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, about um, trying to uh, create the circumstances um, by rejecting transparency to, in a, in a sense, establish the conditions through which things may well be achieved in relation to what you want with transparency. I guess there's a general question around about um, what do you specifically see as the things that need to happen now? And if you were to look, if we made it a bit more specific to say the accounting and finance profession or business management as an arena, what, what do you see as the things that need to be happening as a sort of counter mechanism or counter approach to the, the standard one? Yeah, so in uh, the, the recent uh, past has been characterized by a lot of reform of, of audit. One of the things, uh, and so what happens once the accounts have been, uh, have been uh, published and uh, once, uh, you know, the, the, the accounting framework is, uh, has produced these, uh, these accounts. One important lesson from the Erie story or the Erie history is that actually this, uh, you know, the way in which we design the account, the, the you know, the PNL moving from 
that vertical with a focus on the shareholder and profit to uh, one that actually uh, reduces in order to augment our possibility of mediating shows that, this, uh, that these statements are not neutral. They have an agency. And, and again, I, I, I can quote Latour and the power of inscriptions here. So I think uh, after, you know, even before the reform of audit, we should actually think about the reform of accounting. I don't want to see an account, uh, a financial report that, produce, that, that is uh, driven by uh, uh, you know, the, the, by one single perspective, and that is the perspective of shareholders. I want to move towards one that is, that opens an arena for the debate. Uh, there is one other, another thing that I can say very quickly. One of the income statements that was theorized by one of the uh, pupils of uh, Zappa uh, was an income statement which uh, was in a T format but was divided in three parts. And this is why he was a critical realist. So this is his first Venn model, okay? Uh, the center part of that income statement uh, had values, uh, had items, the value of which was measured by a market transaction. So there was no object, uh, subjectivity there. In a sense, there was a, a market transaction, you know, no valuation, no relativity there. Uh, above that line and below the line, you would find all the items which, uh, the value of which instead requires evaluation, inventories or uh, provisions, uh, beginning inventory on one side and ending inventory on the other because it was in a T format. So the, the bigger the central area was, the more reliable the profit or loss was. The smaller it was, the less reliable it was. So that income statement instilled doubts in the reader, doesn't instill certainty, instill a, a need for further questions further questions that have to be asked in democratic fora. These democratic fora existed for a long time. They are the annual uh, you know, general assemblies that now have become you know, a, a show of, you know, they, they, they are there to communicate results, not to open a debate about the uh, ambiguity of value, not to open a debate uh, about uh, whether, the, uh, you know, whether the auditors and the preparers of the accounts have actually done uh, a good job. Uh, and in a sense, the existence of the audit profession in the way in which it is thought uh, today, and uh, it's good that the, you know, there are proposals for, uh, for changing the Brighton report that Chris has, uh, has done, in a sense, magnifies that, uh, that idea of certainty. And so you, uh, you look at numbers, and I always say, we consume numbers, we have become bulimic. Uh, so we, we consume accounting data as we buy snacks in the supermarket without knowing what, why we're buying them. Or we look at the, at the nutritional in, in instructions there, which is like the equivalent of the accounting standards, but no one tells me whether that is the right snack to eat, whether I should have a different kind of snack, first of all. I think that we should open that debate. Uh, yeah, Gerard, I don't know if you would like to ask your question. I mean, he, Gerard uh, Newman has raised a question about uh, moving it from um, the external corporate reporting arena to the uh, sort of the budgeting arena. And if you want to develop your question, Gerard. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi there, Paolo. Um, yeah, so um, I, th I thought the, the eerie example, um, which, of course, I've seen before, um, uh, it illustrates very well taking a different perspective of viewing financial outcomes from a, a broader stakeholder rather than a shareholder perspective, the shareholder perspective being a very Anglo-Saxon uh, view of the world financially. Um, but what I, I wonder is what your view is on um, the mechanism that we have for budgeting, particularly again in the sort of Anglo-Saxon environment, because the budget is what the outcomes are uh, compared against. And, you know, the framework that we have, certainly in the West, of budgeting um, sets that mindset um, for what we use to compare the outcomes and, you know, potentially might increase the myopia with, wi with which we, we view the, the results, the financial results. It's interesting, Gerald. Thanks for, for asking the, the question, because indeed at Erie, uh, that value-added accounting was done for uh, uh, budgeting and, pl and planning purposes and to link the uh, development of value to national accounting, which is held uh, in, uh, in value-added form, format, and it was uh, Vanoni who 
so one of the three friends and relatives um, uh, who, who set up that system in collaboration with people at ERI. Um, but in a sense, uh, you know, the, uh, the budgeting process is important, not for the final number that you say, that you said, but for the process of budgeting. So the moment in which that uh, outcome is set, uh, you know, uh, it becomes again a, a, a target to be uh, to be pursued. And I remember a, a, a lecture that I gave to some lawyers uh, of a big uh, Finnish multinational, uh, and he said, "I've got my target. I got my target, and I cannot really do anything else. I have to pursue it." And I, I said to him, "Okay, so at the moment you are aligned to that target. Why don't you try to bring a space and say, in pursuing that target, what do I lose?" So open a space for debate. This is the idea of the, of the value added statement here with the space where the SDGs are. In pursuing my economic value, what do I lose? And how can I reach a proportion between the two? And so the, the point is very well made. Uh, the moment in which these uh, budgets become targets and uh, you seek alignment, there is no, the war is lost. You have to make space for debate. And so you got this target, in pursuing that target, what are you missing? What are you, what are you not seeing? Because everything is geared toward that uh, gaze of visibility and transparency, and you become blind. You don't see anything else. I guess we're coming to the uh, end of the session in a way, but I mean, if I had to paraphrase, there's a whole stream of questions come in, but I think probably the last one to raise before I pass back to Fiona is uh, that there does seem to be a a range of questions that are trying to address this notion of how do we come more conscious or more aware or promote an awareness you know and and some questions are saying how do we promote this awareness within the accounting profession because many ceos are trained as accountants so you know they should be maybe a, a ripe audience to talk to but then also there's the issue of talking more interdisciplinary and how do we convince people who seem to come to accounting and accounting late in their sort of research life or practice life and, and then have a very preconceived notion of accounting and maybe, you know, aren't aware of these subjectivities or whatever. Um, how, what, what would be the key things that you would say people need to try and latch on to, to either change their own consciousness as trained accountants or to inspire a shift in consciousness of people who are not very well versed in accounting and are using it in inappropriate ways. And the final thing is something about, you know, the relationship between transparency and uncertainty, you know, so that you, can we deal with uncertainty? Is this what we're running away from? And is that a, um, you know, a flawed, yeah so uh, first question if uh, i think the the story of eerie is also very very important in order to change the mindset it requires almost faith i would say first of all and uh, and second a lot of institutional work so these guys it was amazing how a, 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 a relatively small number of people really moved easily from a fascist country to uh, a democratic country uh, and it, I think it's also our responsibility as uh, teachers and professors uh, who profess uh, to help in those institutional in those in changing those institutional arrangements through teaching in class, through dealing with accounting body, uh, bodies, uh, to uh, engage the regulator and the policymakers and make sure that uh, things can change. If you are trained in that way, you know the only. The only way forward is to read and not read more of the same, but read something different. I mean, uh, we have heard the stuff about uh, critical management in Leicester. Uh, that is uh, critical accounting is needed now more than ever. But a critical accounting that does not stop with the critique, uh, a critical accounting that uh, moves towards the proposal. That is the spirit of uh, this lecture. So I criticize the past, but I want to move forward towards something that is practical and doable. And last thing about uncertainty, um, uh, I teach most of the staff to uh, program managers who run mega projects worth uh, billions of pounds. Uh, they love it because this is a way of exploring ambiguity and uncertainty. They leave that ambiguity and uncertainty on their skin every day. 
and they don't have practices to deal with those with those uh, with those problems because they are trained in a, in, a, in, a, in a way where you know more data will eventually give you the solution. But we know since Bartsch et al. 1980 that accounting doesn't work as an answer machine. Accounting is not an oracle that you interrogate and gives you the answer. It's, it's an instrument to interrogate uh, what you do not know, the mystery of value, the mystery of God for the Jesuits. Yeah, okay, great. Listen, thanks very much, Paolo, for the presentation. It's very clear from a lot of the comments that people have enjoyed it greatly. Um, I would just make an appeal to one or two of you who've, who put in comments saying that in different countries or in different contexts, certain practices that Paolo has been discussing have been applied. I mean, I, I'm sure Paolo yeah, would America, welcome, yeah. really welcome any, uh, you know, contact in terms of just giving some more details rather than get you to explain them in this session. And as I said earlier as well, I think with Paolo having the chance to go through the chat and may, maybe put together some sort of a overall reflection in terms of some of the issues, I've tried to capture as much as I can, but the things keep coming in, Paolo, so I'm sure you're going to have much more um, you know, uh, possibility to review these at a later date. So back to you, Fiona, and, and thanks, Paolo. Yeah, thanks, Thank Chris, and thanks, Paolo, very much for a really interesting uh, lecture there. As Chris said, incredible sets of comments and conversations going on in parallel in the chat box. So I, I really hope we can pick up on those and, uh, and take them forward. I was really thinking hard about how how do we cope with the discomfort of ambiguity? And it is, is the discomfort of, of doing things or thinking things differently, which is, is often hard. And how do we help people to do that is, is something I was reflecting on while, while you were talking. So thank you again, Paolo. Thank you, Chris, for facilitating the session. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Really thrilled that you did, did join us today. And, and do please get in contact. And as I say, thanks again to everybody uh, for joining us and a very special thanks for Paolo in particular. So thank you very much, thank you everyone. Thank you, all. thank you a lot, guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm.